David, will you repeat after me? I, David, take you, Tricia. I, David, take you, Tricia. To be my wife. To be my wife. To have and to hold. To have and to hold. From this day forward. From this day forward. For better or for worse. For better or for worse. For richer, for poorer. For richer, for poorer. In sickness and in health. In sickness and in health. To love and to cherish. To love and to cherish. So long as we both shall live. So long as we both shall live. This is my solemn vow. This is my solemn vow. Make you a cup to go. That'd be awesome. Thanks, babe. It's a nice short drive. Oh God, it's just so good to be back home, sleep in my own bed. Can't believe I got a chance to see Emmy, beat the Padres. <laughs> it's gonna be fun. Are you gonna go to go yeah. to the game tonight? I'll be there tonight. Okay. All right. Perfect. Going with my dad. Him being home feels almost like it's good and bad because yeah. it feels sort of like the off season. Um, but then he leaves for the game. But we love it. Yeah, it's just like, it, it's fun because I get a little bit, like you said, the off season and I get my coffee. Um, I can sit in the backyard, see the dogs. And I didn't get up to see Emmy this morning, but she came home, so I saw her for lunch. So it's a kind of, a, it gives me a little reprieve and gets connected, reconnect with you. On one of those rare days during the season, Dave Roberts is home with his wife, Tricia, in San Diego. Home, where they raise their children, Cole and Emmy. Home, a reminder of the past, when coaching was not on his mind as much as retirement from the game he loved to play. Going back to that time in my life, this is after I got released from the Giants, spring training of uh, 09. And I was going to just kind of spend time with the family, and that was going to retire. And then I got a call about doing something for Nesson and doing some color for road game. He's definitely different. He's making his 2009 debut today, and uh, he features a fastball that's 92, 94, slider, changeup, and a, a cut fastball. So obviously, you know, you look at the radar gun. I don't feel like broadcasting fulfilled the thing in him that needed to be fulfilled. He needs the competition. He needs that the rush of the game. And although he enjoyed the experience, and I know he met some great people, I think he knew it was something he was not going to do forever. And I think that you know, in this situation, this at this point in time, Terry Francona had no other alternative. But I think the one thing that Terry I ended up doing that for '09, and then the following uh, winter, I was talking to Buddy Black. We had lunch at a restaurant uh, in North County in San Diego, and you know I pleaded my case for him to, uh, you know, come back on the field, uh, get out of broadcasting, come with us, start his coaching career. Buddy told me that you can always go back to the booth or work in the front office, but um, just recently out of playing, if you have a desire to coach and teach, he recommended I be on the field. I could tell that his, uh, you know, the wheels were turning. At the core, I mean, Dave's a competitor, and you, you really don't get that from broadcasting. I reached out to Jed Hoyer, who was just named general manager for the San Diego Padres. And I really didn't know Jed when I played for the Red Sox in 04. Um, but I just basically reached out and said, hey, um, I know the Padres, I know the system, I'm from here. If you want any assistance um, in any capacity, I'm here. And then he called me back and said, hey, how about a special assistant job? I used to joke all the time that in San Diego, like there's 8,000 retired players. And so everyone wanted to, to work for the Padres. And Dave was just really smart. He got in there first started talking to him and uh, he knew what he wanted and, and he did a, like, did a good job. The day before he was supposed to leave for spring training, I asked him to open a jar for me. And 
he opened the jar, kind of struggled with it a little bit, and then the next day, he was like, oh, you know, my neck kind of hurts. And I said, from what? He said, I don't know. I think it might be from opening that jar. I'm not sure. And so I looked at it, and I saw a little lump there. And I said, when you get your physical, you should ask Dr. Albers about it. So we're going to do some ground balls, work on your ground balls, get through the ball like you guys are, and then a couple uh, balls angled. So just try to work on your, continue to work on your turns. Once I went to spring training, you're under the protocol, the, the physicals of all the players, coaches, front office staff. I wasn't concerned. I, I, I knew I had a lump, uh, a bump, a strain in my neck. That's kind of a, as the extent of it. And then a week later, two weeks later, there, Dr. Albers, who, who was the doctor at the time for the Padres, um, the physician, said, you need to go back to San Diego and uh, get a scan a PET scan, and I'm like, then I kind of, that didn't make sense. OK, next hitter. And he's still our doctor to this day. So every time I'm in that waiting room, I get, <laughs> I still have memories of it. But I remember sitting at his table, and he just sat us down and said, I'm so sorry to tell you this, but it's cancer. It's, you know, Hodgkin's lymphoma. And we just could not believe it could not believe it. It was such a shock. Backstage Dodgers is brought to you by Cadillac. Visit your Southern California Cadillac dealer today. When you hear the word cancer, what runs through your mind? Death. So this is uh, Dave's original PET scan on March 15, 2010. Here we have all these clumps of lymph nodes on the, l on the right, a clump of lymph nodes on the left, the lower neck, and behind the clavicle. And this is in the, in the middle of the chest. So this is significant involvement with Hodgkin lymphoma. At the time, I can't even say we processed it. I, I think it's one of those circumstances where you're almost out of your body, where you just think, what is going on? I just remember being in the car, like, crying to Trish. Because I just, you know, it's just the end of my world. I just figured, you know, you want to raise your kids and, and you know, spend time with your wife as, as you're done with your baseball career. And my son is 10, my our daughter is 6, and how do we tell the kids? So that's kind of where my head was at at that point. To hear this news, uh, man, it just sort of floors you. Because here's a guy who's young, he's vibrant, uh, he's up all the time. And, and to hear this, it, I mean, it buckled us. And, and this sounds silly because clearly cancer is, is, is everywhere. Uh, but it almost is like it, it doesn't really exist until it hits, hits somebody that you know close. And so I, I certainly would find that out later in the year, in August, I think it was, when my dad found out he had cancer. But uh, it's it's tough. It's tough on it's it's tough on everybody because I think everybody is thinking the same thing when it happens. I've been watching nothing but Dodger games. That's it. Thank you, thank you. In fact, Emmy said to me last night, "This is the highlight of my day watching this game." She's like, "I'll be sitting at school and I'll think, what time's the Dodger game on?" Is that right? Mm -hmm. It's unbelievable. And then she was like talking about the game last night with David, and she's like, even if David would have, uh, get, you know, given up the, the lead, yeah. you guys had your one other up. You guys had another up. Mm -hmm. She called it an up. <laughs> so you had another up. But she just, but she loves watching yeah. baseball. It's amazing. Yep. We are sometimes probably too brutally honest with our kids, but that is a pact we made from the very beginning that we would always tell them the truth. We were at an airport restaurant and we just decided to tell them and we just told them the truth. I think every growing up, every kid thinks that their dad's immortal, he's invincible. Um, so to know that my dad has been diagnosed with that was pretty scary. At the time, I didn't totally know what that meant. And I remember him telling me he wouldn't be able to like pick me up. And I remember him getting tired and 
sleeping more than he used to, so that's when I realized something was wrong with my dad. You know, there's an honesty component, which is great, but there's also, you're telling them something that you really don't know how it's gonna play out. So then there's a little bit of like, am I deceiving them? Because you're encouraging that it's gonna be okay. That's our hope, but I just felt that, you know, we gave them as much information, um, you know, as, as we felt they could handle at that point. So here comes Dr. Vicario, Dan Vicario at uh, San Diego Cancer Center. It was Trisha, myself, our two kids, going to meet him and going to this cancer center. He just basically sat down and pulled up a chair and answered whatever questions we had. He addressed our kids, and he was just so kind, comforting, and really certain that we are gonna get through this. And so at that point, I knew that we were in good hands. What I saw in Dave and Trisha was always this sense of hope, courage, determination, resolve, knowing that he was going to go through the treatment, focus on every day, how to do the best he can each day with the support he has. And they were very optimistic, but realistic, knowing that for several months, it was going to be very difficult for Dave and for the family. After 10 years as a player and one as a broadcaster, Dave Roberts discovered his calling as a coach with the San Diego Padres. And it was early in that career that doctors discovered the Hodgkin's lymphoma, a form of cancer that required a physically taxing, aggressive course of treatment. For this stage of Hodgkin's lymphoma, the treatment was four months of chemotherapy given every two weeks. It did cause significant weakness, nausea, to a point that it was hard for him to stay active and do the things he wanted to do. I'd be coming home from school on some days, wanting to go hit in the cage or play catch with him, and then I'd kind of find him laying in bed, drinking water, whatever it was, sleeping, taking his medicine. And I think that's what kind of put the most fear in me, um, was knowing that he was so sick. At the time, my dad and I, our thing used to be, I would run from the end of our hallway into his arms and I would jump and see how high I could get into his arms. And then I went to do that one day and he told me, Emmy, I can't pick you up anymore. I asked him why and he told me it's because of his cancer and his treatments. And that was taken from me and that made me really, really sad because that's something we always used to do and it made me super, super emotional. He would have his treatment on a Monday, then the rest of the week he would be so sick. And so, you know, that was a week of just taking care of him. And then as soon as he felt well, he would go back to work. And so that, I think, was the hardest part, is that we really only got the Dave that was sick and not so much the Dave that was feeling better. I remember I was still working for the Padres, and I feel guilty even to this day as a former player, a guy that's done it in the big leagues, what are you looking for when you evaluate players at this level? Yeah, you know, I, I think that obviously you got to take their uh, their age into consideration, and you know, they're 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 very young in their professional careers. Um, but I wanted to fulfill my duty. The other part of it was I still wanted to. Um, I think, you know, going to the ballpark, seeing players, coaching players, was a diversion. It kept me motivated and it kept me positive. When he first started losing his hair, that was kind of scary, but um, he ended up bringing me to Petco Park with him, um, being around all the players and stuff like that, coaches, and he was like just as happy as he usually is. So that kind of gave me hope that he was gonna be okay. There was days he was really run down, but he always wanted to be there. I think coming in and watching a baseball game with us became his escape, and you know, we were more than happy to provide it. The physical, he's there and he's he's coaching. You can see it in his face. You can see it in his mannerism. It'd be in those moments that you would remember, man, he is, he's fighting, he's fighting for his life. So what time are you gonna go to the game then? I think I'm gonna try to see Emmy's tennis match at 
and then oh, three, three, okay. because they said we could go today. Oh, it's so exciting. I know, my first one. It's the first one parents can go to. Is it really? Mm -hmm. I could have not done this without Trish. She was going through uh, Somalia school at that point in time, and she had to put a lot of that on hold to kind of make sure that I was okay, and uh, she's done that our entire marriage. She was the driver, and uh, I 100% I, I know I couldn't have got there without her. I have a huge appreciation for what my mom did um, during that time because obviously it took a big toll on my dad, and I'm sure it took a big toll on her mentally as well. Um, but just like my dad, she never let that show. I can't say enough about her. She is a warrior. She is my idol. I'll always look up to her and be hope to be half the woman that, that she is. And I just remember her always being there for Cole and I when we would cry to her um, and just saying everything is going to be OK and just reassuring us that dad was going to get through it. Um, and I know for her as a wife, that must have been so hard to watch your husband struggle like that. Um, but she always did it with a smile on her face and a positive outlook. I could sing her praises all day long, but she was so, so strong. So this is a PET scan two months later that shows complete resolution of the abnormal uptake by the Hodgkin lymphoma cells. So this is a dramatic response to treatment. And this is what was made us all so optimistic that after two months of the chemotherapy, he had an outstanding response. So this is uh, Dave's first PET scan, March of 2010. So here we see the activity in the, the neck, right, left, and in the middle of the chest. And if we look at two months later, there is complete resolution of everything we saw here in March, two months after treatment. All these, the yellow areas are gone. That was already a sign that he had a, an outstanding response. After the four months, a repeat PET scan being normal, we were already talking about a cure and needing the radiation therapy to consolidate and complete the treatment to keep him cured for the rest of his life. He had done chemo, then he, then he did radiation, and after that he had his first PET scan, and I remember them telling us, nothing's lighting up, you know, he's cancer free, and it just felt so, it was such a relief to just know that what he had been doing all these months was working. He was over the moon, and I remember him telling me, and I questioned, I was like, so that means your cancer's completely gone? And he was like, yeah, I'm cancer free. And I remember that moment just being so thankful that everything he had gone through was worth it, and all the struggle and the sickness and the tiredness and everything that he had gone through and fought through was worth it and that it was finally gone. I've had a chance to win a World Series as a player, win a World Series as a manager, um, and those are things that I'm very proud of. Um, but beating cancer tops the list by a landslide. Overcoming it and winning that fight, that trumps uh, any championship that uh, I've been fortunate enough to be a part of. We still talk about that, that lunch at, at Milton's restaurant. If he didn't take this job, if he wouldn't have gone through the team physical, you know, when would have this showed up? You know, when would have this been diagnosed? Things do happen for a reason. The conversations that we had, which led to that decision ultimately, certainly played a huge part. And so uh, Buddy is one of the most uh, humble guys I know. So for me to say that he helped save my life, uh, I, I think he would disagree, but I, I certainly believe that. Love oh, thank you, baby. I think just the older I get, I, I realize how much health is such a gift. I just feel so lucky that Dave made it through that and that our family made it through and that we are all sitting here today healthy and happy. I take flight on borrowed time. I was once terrified of heart. It's been such a long and hard journey for him that I'm so happy as a 16 year old to see him come out the other side and I think I have a new appreciation for every moment that I get to spend with my dad because those moments could have easily been taken away. Okay, Emmy and Daddy 
are practicing their back dives. <laughs> this experience kind of was in addition to what I already knew growing up that my dad was like the strongest. Um, he'll do whatever he can to keep his family close to him, support us even when he has his plate full. I actually think this really did strengthen us as a family because every family goes through trials um, and to be able to go through like this together was a big mountain that we climbed. I appreciate him so much. He is, he's a great husband, he's a great father. Um, he teaches our kids so much about optimism and being positive. He's the biggest part in every room and he makes everyone feel important, including me. And I just, I love and appreciate him so much. I tell this story every time real love don't follow a straight line, it breaks. And it is not only marrying the right partner, but learning to be the right partner. Okay, look at me. Say big brother, look at me. The boys and the new girl. Hi, Emmy. Hope you're doing well. Say hi to Cleo for me. He's doing okay, baby. It's my pleasure to announce that we found our man in Dave Roberts. The manager of the year winner has done so in his first full season on the job. This year in the National League, it is the Dodgers' Dave Roberts. It didn't take for me to have cancer to, to appreciate uh, how fortunate I am. But certainly, I, I look at where I'm at now. I mean, I pinch myself all the time when I think about I'm the manager of the Los Angeles Dodgers. It just, it's mind blowing. is a part of my story. Um, it's not who I am, but it's a great part of my story and I just happy I was able to live to tell it. I was asked to say a few uh, words about my um, new bride and uh, it was pretty easy and uh, there's so many things I want to say to you Trish. Uh, first off I just want to say that uh, I, I consider myself the luckiest man in the world. I mean seriously I mean you've been everything to me uh, more than I can ask for and I I just don't know what I would do without you, and I love you very much with all my heart. I'm gonna be the best husband for you forever, I promise you, and uh, babe, I just love you so much, and uh, you, you mean the world to me. And uh, that's about it. 